Welcome to what is episode nine of 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, a station dedicated to honoring the legacy of Marine Corps tankers and remembering the stories of what made the community special told through the words of those Marines that towed the line. And man, today is a good one. Oh, I'm so excited about today. Today, I'm joined by a true celebrity Marine. It is my distinct honor to welcome to 100 Years of Marine Corps Tankers, the Cigar Marine, Gunner Sergeant Nick Popovich. Gunny Pop is, has been showcased nationally for his involvement in OIF, authoring two successful books, having a political career, plus a very illustrious career uh, post the Marine Corps. So Gunny Pop, welcome to you, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me aboard, sir. Absolutely, thanks for joining the channel. So uh, what we're gonna do uh, per, uh, per SOP, we're gonna go back a little bit and talk about uh, who you are, how you kind of came to be a Marine. And what I found interesting going through your bio is it almost sounds to, I mean, if you would read these separately, it almost sounds like two separate careers because you had a career on the 60s and then you, uh, you took a small break and then had a career on an M1A one. So uh, we're going to cover it that is here. Kind of, it is kind of funny that I did uh, exit the Marine Corps. I, I EAS uh, got out after just, just under six years of active duty service. And uh, it was right when we were transitioning from the M60 to the M1A one. So I didn't transition with the, with the tank battalion. And when I came back in, it was a new tank. So yes, it was like two different, two, two different things. That's awesome, man. So uh, providing a background, you were born in 1967 out in Chicago and joined the Marine Corps in, uh, in 86 after going to uh, North, how do you say that, Terre Haute High School? In, uh, Terre Haute Chicago? means Terre Haute. Highland, Highland. All right. All right. All right. So 18 years old, enlisted, and uh, attained the uh, MOS of 1811. And for all of us young bucks out there uh, who may not know what an 1811 is, 1811 is an M60A1 uh, tank crewman. So that, that designator ended up changing, but you were one of the original ones. I was, I was very blessed on that. I signed up on something called a, uh, what they call it? Uh, uh, geez, I'm, I, I wanted to remember that too. It was like a combined arms option. It was, I forget exactly what they call it, enlistment program, where you're going to be some sort of trigger puller. My recruiter told me about it. I said, well, I like the sound of that. You know, you're going to be a tanker, artilleryman, infantryman, something that pulled a trigger in the Marine Corps. And uh, so I thought, that sounds good. You know, so that's, and then they just end up being tanks. Awesome. So I uh, went to Knox in, in 86 and then went out to uh, what I found interesting, 1st Tank Battalion, but not the 1st Tank Battalion that we know. In fact, it was actually at Camp Pendleton. So uh, I believe that it was, was the Camp Alpha Pendleton. Ramp, right? My buddy was, uh, my buddy in tank school, you know, because everything's alphabetical, was Petrovic, was in Hanson Popovich Petrovic, he's next to me. And he was from Azusa, California. He kept telling me about Southern California, like it was this magical land. And he says, we got to put him for Camp Pendleton. Because back then they had... Uh, you know, they had tanks in Cuba, they had tanks in Okinawa, tanks, you know, East Coast, West Coast, desert. Then we were all over the place. And so, uh, but he was kept talking about Camp Pendleton. He's like, we got to go there. We got to go to Camp Pendleton. So that's what I put on my dream sheet. I was lucky. I got it. Uh, I checked into the battalion. I got there just after Christmas. I was home for Christmas. I was at cycle from tank school that graduates in December. Mm -hmm. uh, I was home for Christmas. And then I, got, I was really anxious to get out there. So I got out there. And uh, the best thing that happened was when I checked in, they said, uh, don't even unpack your sea bag because we're going to uh, uh, Camp Fuji, mainland Japan. I was so excited about that. I thought that was just the neatest thing in the world was to go, you know, go around the world. That's what I joined the Marine Corps to do is right. go see the world. And uh, so within 30 days of hitting the fleet, I was over in uh, mainland Japan uh, driving that M60 tank. It just felt like I had the best job in the world. Really loved it. It's because you did. <laughs> it's the best job in the world. So, yeah. uh, so after, uh, after Pendleton, well, going out there, you, like, you, like you mentioned, you were part of what I found interesting was it was Charlie Tracks. So, uh, so it would actually be <laughs> TV. So I think the designator, if I'm reading this correctly, is 1st Track Vehicle Battalion, 3rd Marine Division. So 1st Track Vehicle Battalion was on Camp Schwab, Okinawa, and it had one tank company and three companies of tracks. My company was from that, from that battalion, but it was in Camp Pendleton because of the UDP cycle. So we would do 18 months in Camp Pendleton and six months in Oki, and there were four companies that rotated through. So they were Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Charlie Tracks from the, from the original battalion over there in Okinawa. And it was pretty neat working on a ramp like that because, you, you know, you're, uh, it's three companies of Amtraks, one company of tanks, and you're right there on the ocean. And you, you watch these Amtrakers, they would they roll off and go out in the ocean and open those, those, uh, those big doors up and go swimming off the track. And you think, it's kind of neat to see how the other app lives once in a while. Yeah, for sure. So then, so while you were out there, you were never moved from first tanks. You were assigned to what, what then became CTV 3-2, uh, 
uh, and where you we, we rose very quickly to from driver to loader to gunner and then ultimately to tank commander. And uh, I was re I was really blessed on that. That uh, I did like my first four years in the Marine Corps on the same tank. I, I never moved from that tank. I started out as a driver. I moved up to be the loader, the gunner, and then the tank commander. And I commanded that tank until I left that company to come go over to Bravo for the deployment to Desert Desert Shield Desert Storm. And uh, just blessed. I had a, a great gunner coming up through that tank. Just great crewmen I served with all the way around. But a gunner, the gunner was this fellow named Corporal Ascaris. And he, he taught me something that I just carried with me. To, I, I carried to this day, but he used to talk about being the 0400 Marine. And we were just sitting around one day on the ramp, you know, just doing what we do, you know, turning wrenches and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, you get these guys are kind of, I, I, people in modern day will call them posers or whatever, but you got guys that, you know, kind of, may look the part, they may talk the part, but you, you, they're just not really it. And he used to say, he said, that's, that's how you want to be. He says, you want to be the zero four in the Marine. At four in the morning when you're cold, you're tired, you're wet, wounded, whatever the heck it is, when you're up against the wall, the guy who believes it then, who believes it Semper Fi then, the one who, who believes in courage, honor, commitment then, that's who you want to be. And so I, I took that as, okay, anybody can talk about it. But the one who's always training for it, training for those, those, those moments. And we used to have this thing in the time between Lascaris' advice and this other thing that we used to have. It was really neat because they, the, they put it in the head. And it was a picture. And they put it right, you know, right in front of the, the, the pistol there. So when you're, when you're using that, you're looking right at it. And it had a Soviet, because that's who our enemy was back right. then. The Soviets were the, the main bad guys. And a Soviet, uh, you know, whatever the heck, they, their guys were a trooper there. And he's got his AK-47, and it said, somewhere in the world right now, your enemy is training to kill you. And that really impacted me, so much so that when I became like a platoon sergeant later on in life in the Marine Corps, I never wanted to ever let there be a dull moment like that. I never wanted my troops not training, not preparing. Now, I felt like I was failing them as a, as a leader if I wasn't always training them. And even back then, as a tank commander, I would always do that. So when we were, when we were on a tank, we were always practicing to engage or, you know, how to, how to do this stuff a little bit better. If we were doing uh, any sort of, like, because like, on Pendleton, you do a lot of dry fire stuff because you, there's only a certain place you can shoot. It's not like, not like throwing at balls, you can shoot anywhere. And when we were doing that, I would always put, like, malfunctions on the tank. Like, okay, you know, close the ballistic doors and let's do it with the auxiliary side. Or let's do it with this or do it with that. And always so the... I always felt that was my role as a leader, and I got that from Lascaris on that first tank group, was that you always got to be preparing for that moment. Anybody can talk about it, but the one who does the work, the, the zero corner moment stuff. That's great, stuff. great guy. Yeah, that's good stuff. I mean, that's, that, that's something I've kind of tried to, to look at as well. Uh, you, know, you, you know, downtime, everyone talks about downtime. There's so much downtime in the military. Well, downtime is just lack of creativity come up with something that, that, that generates the time, even, even if it's, even if it's something fun, even if it's something else generate the time. But now, I mean, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying and, and, and appreciate it. And that, that's a great leadership trait. I agree wholeheartedly on that. So much so that like when people would ask me about combat, I would you know, later on, I would say, geez, that's the only time I got to relax. Cause other than that, I was always having to dream up some sort of training for these guys. <laughs> and I was always having to stretch my mind for how do I use this time? How do I, how do I create some, some training opportunity out of this? And then at least the combat stuff you can just do. Right. You know, I didn't have to be dreaming stuff up. Can I, can I share one more thing from back Please. then? I just Absolutely. want to talk about uh, another, the, both, two of the best things I pulled out at first enlistment were from corporals. And the only one was a corporal. He wasn't in my platoon. Uh, his name was Corporal Moody. And we were getting, this when we were in Okinawa. And we were getting ready for a CG inspection. So, you know, it gets a lot of, back then we used to do like the wall locker and J-O-B and all that stuff. I, I think that kind of, maybe they still do it. I don't know. It seemed to be a phasing out thing. So we're getting, the, we're getting all this stuff ready, and the, the, I, I'll, I'll spare you the details, but I wasn't, I wasn't doing the best job of preparing for it. And the company commander got pretty ticked off at me, and they sent Moody to come down there and square me away. Moody was a pretty big corporal, and uh, I thought he was coming down there to beat the crap out of me. <laughs> and, he, you know, and, I, and I deserved it because I, you know, I, wasn't, I wasn't exactly flying with the program. I, I felt that what they were doing was not the right way to do it. And I was kind of being really stubborn about it. And so much so the company commander sent Moody down there to square me away. And Moody came in there and I'm thinking he's going to beat the crap out of me. And, and, I, and I deserved it. And, but he did. And what Moody did was he talked to me. He said, you know, he said, look, he said, anybody can sit around here and gripe. That's easy. Anybody can do that. He says, if you really care, 
stick around here for longer than five minutes, put some stripes on yourself, and then you run it the way you think it should be run. And I thought, man, and that was, I used that in corporate America. I used that everything after the Marine Corps. I would always tell people about Corporal Moody telling me that. Anytime I had somebody griping about something yeah. with five minutes on the job, but they, they, they know enough to gripe, apparently. <laughs> and uh, that was just great advice, great advice. And they did, you know, don't, don't gripe about it, change it. And that was just spot on. No, that's excellent. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that obviously followed you through the rest of your career. Um, you know, and, and yeah, let's, let's very go. blessed. Let's go back a little bit to August 1990 when you deployed to Saudi Arabia for Operation Desert Shield. Um, I mean, this this was this was one of the first ones. Um, so there, there you are, you know, young young Marine, uh, and, and you're 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 deployed out to uh, you know middle middle desert, which uh, you know I don't think you guys knew very much about that at the time. I mean, I <laughs> no, we know, didn't. <laughs> I know there probably wasn't a whole lot of cultural classes and a whole lot of the stuff that you know we got subsequent years later, but. Uh, I mean, how they, they pretty much put your butts on a plane and, and put you guys out there. And you were chopped to 3-9 Bravo Company. Um, and then that became the breaching company for Task Force Papa Bear. And you were a commander out there. So what, uh, what experience, what, what memories, you know, does, does that kind of bring back? It was really quick because yeah, we, were, we were in Camp Pendleton, you know. And back then it was, you know, the, Panama had come and gone. We didn't go on that. There were even a couple of things you've seen happen in the world, but we didn't go. And so – you know, you get to where you just kind of didn't really pay. I didn't. I, uh, let me put it in first person. I, I didn't really pay that much attention to it. And so when Saddam invaded Kuwait, you know, <laughs> there were guys in there watching in the rec room and they're, you know, they're watching the news. And I used to make fun of them. I said, what are you going to tell if we're deploying by watching the news? <laughs> you're going you're gonna to figure out what's happening here. And about a week later, we were sitting out in that desert. It was really quick from when they said go to when we left. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then, and, even then, I'd, I'd been in about four years, I guess, at that point. I was a tank commander. And it got – the the real moment was when we first started busting out because we did MPF offload. We took tanks off the MPF ship. Mm -hmm. And then when we started busting out that ammo and you started seeing black sable rounds and white, lead, or white markings, I'm like, okay, we're really getting ready to fight somebody now. Mm -hmm. And we went out in the desert and we manned the, we manned the border between Saudi and Kuwait in case the Iraqis came south into Saudi. That was what the initial part was. And, you know, and everybody, and then it, months rolled on and rolled on. And so everybody started to realize, well, this is, you know, it was, you can get complacent. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we have one master sergeant, Master Sergeant Graham, another great mentor I had throughout my time. I was very blessed. My first three deployments were with him as a tank leader. And I learned more about life, Marine Corps, just amazing things from this individual. But he was a Vietnam veteran. He was our only combat veteran. And he was saying, well, if we're just here to defend the border. Why are we still training? What are we still doing? He knew we were getting ready to go offensive. We were going to attack. And then sure enough, they started bringing in mine plows, mine rollers, all these things. So because uh, the Iraqis had these two, these two minefield belts that defended the border there. And so then we started training offensively. I was commanding a mine plow tank in second platoon. I was Bravo 2-2. And our company was the, was the breaching breaching company. We were attached at 3-9, and we were, our job was to knock the two lanes open for Task Force Papa Bear, which I guess probably comprised about half the 1st Marine Division was Papa Bear, the other half was probably Ripper. And uh, it was pretty neat. I was in the assault force. We had a platoon. Uh, third platoon was, a, was to open one lane. First platoon was to open another lane. I was in second platoon, and we split, and we were to assault through the two lanes and basically open the door for the rest of 3-9 to come pouring through. It was, uh, it was defended by three, it, it was so neat when uh, we're doing the movement to that, to the, to the second minefield. We did the first one unopposed, mm -hmm. and then we did the second one to the, uh, to the second breach site that was going to be defended. It was defended by three infantry companies, the platoon of tanks, and uh, 122 uh, self-propelled artillery. Mm -hmm. And when the lieutenant drew that in the sand, I was like, wow, we're really going to go fight somebody. This, this, is, this is real stuff. And it was, it was really neat. And uh, it was exciting. It was, you know, a little bit nervous because you tank him out. You don't want to let nobody down or nothing like that. But when, we seen the, when I seen my first battlefield, and I seen, you could see the trench lines. You could see the enemy infantry. You could see enemy tanks. It was, it, it was, it was everything I kind of pictured it to be. And, I, and sometimes I think back to that time because our first main gun round was a hit. And I wonder if that first one would have been a miss. <laughs> would have changed my whole trajectory as a tank or what I'm like, my confidence had been blown or whatever. 
So uh, the company commander comes out to attack, and he says, he's a problem, let's start knocking out some of these hard targets, or knock out some of these targets. My gunner picks up a bunker, because uh, this is three infantry companies in these trench lines. They, used to, they, were, they were zigzaggy, like, like the pattern on Charlie Brown's shirt. Mm -hmm. And so he picks up a bunker, I range it, and it's 2200 meters. That's a heck of a shot for a heat round. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we bust it off, you get that obscuration, we're, we're moving, we're still in the movement of contact. And so we're moving through this obscuration. We finally bust out of it. The top was off that bunker and, it, and all the crap was everywhere from inside. It was a hit. And, uh, and then it's just like everything was just flowed from there. It was the first one was a little nervous for the first main gun round, but everything after there was, was gravy. Uh, once we got on the other side of the breach site, we got in the trench lines. It was, uh, and there was a big difference between the, kind of the, the Gulf War and the current one. And that one was a lot more conventional because once we got on the other side, the, our infantry is getting in the trench lines and we're, we're firing machine guns out ahead of them. And it's, it was a lot more conventional, a lot more the way we trained to fight. Uh, the other side put up, you know, they, they were in uniforms, mm -hmm. <laughs> just, you know, big you change, change from that one to this one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, looked more like how you pictured a war looking, or at least how I did. That, that was kind of what that one was. We did the breach site, and then we, uh, we continued to most, – most of it was movement to contact. We did a number of offensive operations. They were mostly movement to contact type stuff. Yeah. And I always thought it was pretty interesting because our last position, our last overwatch, our last objective we took was Kuwait International Airport. And when we landed for OIF, uh, for OIF we landed at that same airport. So it was almost like pick it up right where we left off. That was <laughs> my last two. objective in the other <laughs> war. First place I landed on this one. I was even in the yeah. same platoon. I was in Bravo Company, second platoon. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. I got to tell you, uh, you know, that, that story, I mean, it's, it's invaluable. I, you know, it was invaluable back then, but, but in light of the divestment and in light of the fact that our community is going away, I mean, that, that story is really taking on a whole new meaning um, because, you know, you are, you are a very valuable commodity yourself. Your, your, your experiences are very valuable. But the ability to kind of tell it and capture it, you know, I'm just honored to have you on the channel. I mean, that's, that's, that's really the bottom line. The bottom line is that, you know, I know you've spoken to many tank battalions. And I know a lot of folks know you. A lot of folks have seen you on television. But the, 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 the way you painted that picture, you know, I, can, I almost was there. I mean, I, I, can, I can picture the trench lines. I can picture, I can picture the smoke. You know, I, I can picture all the rounds cooking off. Um, and unfortunately, you know, from today on, there are not going to be any Marine Corps tankers that are going to have that experience. So that, that experience is going to become more valuable as time goes on. And, and thank you for sharing it. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, and one of the things that I, you know, just one more thing from back then Please. with, with a whole battalion, because when, when we operate on Camp Pendleton, we, we never operate as a battalion, especially with the UDP cycle going on. One company was a Westpac company. We never did anything as a battalion. You, you, company was the biggest tank unit you've ever seen. And when we were doing that, that, that war back then, it was amazing to see like the whole battalion of tanks out there. Now we were chopped in the infantry. So for us, we had 17 tanks making a big arrow. And then you had the columns of Amtrak's behind us all the way to the horizon. And so it, it, to see that much stuff, because in the open desert, because Saudi desert is a lot, is different from Iraqi mm -hmm. desert. Saudi desert and Kuwaiti desert is more like the Bugs Bunny desert, like just mm -hmm. that open sand dune type stuff. And when you can see all that stuff out there, I mean, you look at that and you think, this, we, I wouldn't want to be on the other side of this. Right. It's a pretty impressive thing when you see it all rolling. And so when, guy, when we start doing the new deployments, guys who hadn't been to combat, I would tell them that. I'd say, when you see, you know, you've only seen it like on CACs maybe or whatever. When you see all this stuff out there actually doing what it does, mm -hmm. it's pretty impressive. You're going to realize pretty quick you're on the right side of this whole <laughs> thing. And you wouldn't want to be on the other side of this. No, it's great. Uh, so after that, you came back to the battalion and you threw in there that when you came back, you, uh, you had a very illustrious football career where you, uh, you, guys, <laughs> you guys won and uh, almost took best of the West. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to not include that. So we'll, uh, we'll throw a little bit of, a little bit of comedy <laughs> relief in there, but uh, you know, hats off to you guys for your football team. So then, uh, it, it relo you know, first thing hey, we time, took, we took take battalion football very seriously back then. So, so did we, <laughs> absolutely. So did we. That's how I knew we were going to war, by the way. That, that fellow I told you about, Master Sergeant Graham, Top Graham, 
he was the uh, he was our football coach as well, and they, he took nothing more seriously other than you know combat. He took right. nothing more seriously than football. And this was when the Saddam when he invaded Kuwait. We came out to football practice, and Top came out there. He went in his coaching gear. He was in his camis. And we said, what's going on? Tommy said, football practice been canceled. We said, holy shit, we're going to war. <laughs> we knew that, was the only, that was the only reason Top would cancel football practice. <laughs> no briefs, no nothing. Hey, that's it. Top's in uniform. We're rocking. I got it. That's awesome. We're going to fight. <laughs> we're rocking. One more, one right. more on that, because I was in Charlie Tracks, as was Top. Right. And uh, they, we were the smallest company. I guess probably because we'd just come back from Okinawa. I don't, whatever reason, we were a very small company. And so they disbanded our company and sent them to the other. We melded into the other companies. That's why I went to Bravo. And uh, Top was talking to one of my friends, <laughs> Corporal Robinson. And he says, uh, hey, I want you to make a list of all the people we need over on Bravo. And, and Rob says, well, you mean like the, the football players? He's like, no, we ain't going to play ball. But we're going to war and get the tankers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. <laughs> so... Uh... So there you are. Uh, First Tank Battalion relocated to 29 Palms, uh, where, where it currently is and was up until this year. Um, sad day. Absolutely sad day. Um, but then uh, then transitioned to the M1A1. And uh, at that time, you said, screw it. I'm not going to stick around for the M1A1. I'm going to get out. So you got out and you spent... Uh, uh, it, it really didn't have nothing to do with the M1A1. I know, I'm I, <laughs> I, I'd done like a lot of guys. I came in at 18. Right. And I'd never had like a, you know, I worked at McDonald's. I was a burger flipper when I joined the Marine Corps. So I never had like a real civilian job. I thought maybe there was some different world out there. I don't know. I don't know why I did it, but 18 seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Or, you know, I was about 24 when I got out, but it it seemed reasonable. I'd never been out in the civilian world. Mm -hmm. Got out there, didn't really, didn't really find anything that was overly rewarding. So I went down to recruiter and I said, taking prior service guys back in. And uh, it was a female gunny. She said, I just happened to walk in on the right day. And they had this prior service uh, enlistment program. I re-enlisted under that. I was, uh, I put in the package and you wait. It's, it takes like about, you know, eight weeks for the package to come back. So this eight weeks comes and goes and I still didn't get nothing back. So I called up Todd Graham, again, the same guy. He was at the tank school at Fort Knox. And I said, hey, Top, I said, I, I haven't heard nothing back about this package. He says, what are you doing right now? I said, you're going to work because I work night shift. And he said, call in sick and wait by the phone. So I did. I called him and uh, told him. I actually used a personal day because I'm so, mm-hmm. such an honest guy by, by nature. So I, could, I couldn't say I was sick. I, I used a personal day. And uh, they called me back a couple hours later and said, we re-enlist you tonight. Can you be in Fort Knox in the morning? Wow. And uh, Indianapolis is about two and a half hours from Fort Knox. I said, mm-hmm. sure. And I went down there, re-enlisted in civvy clothes because uh, I got out as a sergeant. I had to come back in as a Lance Corporal under this peace up program. Yeah. So I didn't have any uniforms with my, <laughs> my right rank on them. <laughs> so, and I called him. I said, well, what, what do you want me to report in? And, you know, I, I, got, I got uniform. I can report in in camis. I got those. Right. Or I could report in in, in Charlie shirt and Charlie's or Alpha's, but they're going to have Sergeant Chevron's on them and I'm a Lance Corporal. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said, just report in in civvies. So I reported in to Fort Knox and civvies. The, the, uh, the duty NCO, he thinks I'm some dummy boo who doesn't have enough sense to report in as Alpha. So he's mm-hmm. trying to high stress me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. You know, and I had enough sense to know he's, he's just doing what he's supposed to do. Right. And uh, I went back through tank school on the M1A1 which was good because it, it, it is a whole different world between those two tanks. They are, they are entirely different. Um, first time I shot the M1A1, like for real, not like, not like in tank school. First time I actually shot it on actual gunnery. I was like, geez, if I, if I, if we did this, you know, cause we're doing like offensive engagements mm-hmm. doing about 10, 15, you know, miles an hour and you're hitting targets, two seconds, four seconds, you know, 1500, 1600 meters. I was like, geez, if I did this on an M60 tank, they would form a line from here to next week just to kiss my backside over that. <laughs> right. And on this one, it's like a free throw. It's just, it's, it's easy. Not easy is the wrong word, but it's, it's different. Different in a way better way. So I, I was 27 when I enlisted. And I enlisted, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a post 9-11 baby. Um, you know, I, lost, I lost friends in the tower. And, and that's, that's really the main sorry factor that. that I uh, ended up joining the Marine Corps. Um, but I was 27, you know, I, I had a, I had a civilian career, um, you know, relatively successful and, and dropped it all and, and put my right hand up and I enlisted. What was it like being 24, almost 25, 
having been a sergeant, having been a combat veteran, to go check in the tank school as a lance corporal. Like I can't even imagine like like the humility and just the fact that you did like eat a humble pie like every single day because you've been there, done that, and you're you know at that point. I mean, yeah, you hell you you were a combat veteran, and, and here you are with Marines that are you know weeks old. And you got to do the same thing they do. And I mean, obviously, I mean, how, how did you handle that? Well, no, I, I, I was, again, I was always very blessed. I had a uh, staff sergeant Potts. I think he went on to become a sergeant major. Uh, yeah. Staff sergeant Potts was my platoon sergeant. And he was just, he was fantastic. I mean, he was an easy person to respect. You know, I would have, I would have respected him no matter when I met him. And the, the boots were, they were great because they're motivated, they're fired up. It's fun to be around young people fresh out of boot camp, you know, because they're fired up all the time. So yeah, I had a blast. And uh, I guess the only thing I would have worried about, because I was, I was 27, 28 years old, I guess, at that time, was, uh, you know, and I'm, and I'm having to run PT with kids fresh out of boot camp. Uh, so I made sure I showed up in good shape. You know, I made sure I, knew, I did my, put in my mileage before I got there. Nice. That would have been difficult, you know, because nobody's going to respect if you're in the back, you're in the back you're, you know, doing, <laughs> doing that stuff. So yeah, I, I uh, but I enjoyed it. I, I, had a, I had a blast around these guys. They were, they were, they were an absolute blast when, uh, when we all got our orders to go, you know, go from there to the fleet. Uh, I went to the same company with about a handful of them, probably about six of them. We all went to the Alpha Company out there. Yeah, I enjoy. I, I stayed friends with those guys throughout my time. I, I might have advanced a little quicker than them because I had a lot of, you know, prior service. But uh, no, I, there was no humble pie about it. Uh, when I got out to the fleet. I had um, <laughs> Tom McClintock was the tank leader I reported to out there in the, in the Alpha Company, and he pulled me in and he said, "Look," he said, uh, "he said I better, you know, he kind of read me the riot act that I better not be out there giving any of his NCOs a hard time." And I said, "No," I said, "Look, Tom," I said, "I, I've been in the Marine Corps a long time. I know, I know, I know what I am. A Lance Corporal, they're they're corporals and sergeants. I got it." I said, "I'm not gonna give him a hard time. I said, I'm not gonna play stupid to make him comfortable. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, not, I'm not gonna pretend I don't know things that I know. I'm not gonna do that." And, you know, some of the, you know, that I might have butted heads with one or two of them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> those are maybe not the best stories for right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm, they're probably the ones the audience wants to hear. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, obviously, go, going back to Alpha Company, um, you know, you, you quickly promoted back to the sergeant and then took a hot shot uh, once and then you attended Master Gunner School. So, uh um, you know, you, at that point, you kind of ran full circle between your experience with the 60s and now you're on the A1s and you, and you ran it all the way up to Master Gunner School. So um, before I get into the DI experience, do you have anything about Master Gunner School or the kind of the path to get there? When, uh, when I wrote that down on the bio about the Master Gunner School, it took me a second to remember this guy's name because there were, there were, well, there were two instructors there, Top Dangerfield. He was a gunny then, Gunny Dangerfield. But I, I remembered him because I served him later in the fleet. But the other guy's name, I was like, I was trying to recall his name. Gunny Fonda was his name. Mm. And he used to do the maintenance side. And he used to have a policy. If you did anything wrong on the maintenance side of Master Gunner School, because it would give you problems to, to troubleshoot the fire control system, which was uh, second and third echelon stuff. It was stuff we didn't have a, I didn't have a, a background in. Mm. And so you make a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes doing that. And Gunny Fonda had a policy. Every time you did something wrong, you ordered five pull-ups. He had a pull-up bar behind his tank there in the maintenance bay. And I thought sometimes I'd leave some of those maintenance problems. I'd have to pay him on installments. I'd, sometimes I'd come out and turn up, own like 50 push pull-ups. You can't lift your arms above your head. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay on a payment plan. I ain't going to be able to crank out 50 of them on that bar. And so, uh, yeah, Gunny Fonda and Gunny, and Gunny Dangerfield. And I don't know what, what happened to Gunny Fonda. I know, you know, obviously Dangerfield, I'm going to become Master Gunnery Sergeant. I would serve with him later and uh, very blessed to know both of them. And uh, the Master Gunner School was, wow, that was amazing. You know, cause uh, we had three Marines in there. You go in there with a, a bunch of soldiers, most of your class are gonna be soldiers. And those guys were good guys. You know, they were, uh, it was a lot of fun getting to know those guys. And, uh, it, but you really, you know, you as Marines, we gotta make sure we're, we're, we're top of the heap. You know, we have to, you know, kind of talk a little crap to the rest right. of them, make sure we're in the front of the run. We used to run loops around the formation and stuff when we would run and stuff like that. So we always had fun with the soldiers. And they and they had a pretty good, pretty good sense of humor about it too. Because if we ever fell short on anything, well, they, they'd let us hear it too. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah they, that was a great experience. And, and walking out of it, knowing how to, because, you know, 
going from the M60 tank to the M1, the biggest problem for me, and I think for everybody, was when I came up on the M60 tank, we had 30 years of knowledge on that tank. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew so much detail on that tank. If your tank didn't start, I knew how to pull off a cannon plug down by the engine and use 250 cal rings, 250 cal brasses to, to hotwire a tank. Right. And there was so much knowledge, like any M60 tank is going to remember that trick. <laughs> so when your batteries are low, you could, fire, you could fire it up with that cannon plug and 250 cal rings. And there was all kinds of little things like that that we knew about that tank. And now we're on this M1A1 and we didn't know crap about it. And so if, if you talk to guys who were around back when we transitioned, they'll tell you a lot of stories about, you know, like of our 14 tanks, 12 of them were down, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody's shooting off of one tank, that there was just, uh, we had so much trouble keeping them running, making them do what they're supposed to do, because we just didn't have the knowledge base on it. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Master Gunner School, it was like, it was like somebody opened up this, this, uh, this wealth of knowledge, like I, I <laughs> I felt so empowered walking out of that school, knowing how to fix that fire control system, knowing how to make that tank do the things that it actually can do. That's, I, I love that school. That so we, uh, we, were, we were up at Miramar doing a, uh, uh, the air show, you know, we, we do the dog and pony and uh, a gentleman got up there, older gentleman, um, and he had his grandkids with him, you know, and I, I started talking to the grandkids and, and kind of spending some time with them. And he gets inside the tank and he's like, hmm, this thing, huh? I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, you know, the number one problem with this, with this beast. And when he called it a beast, I knew he was something. You know? <laughs> he knew, knew a I'm little like, something about I'm it. Like, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll bite. What's the number one problem, sir? He's like, there's no belly hatch. And I'm like, you're a 60s <laughs> tanker, aren't you? He's like, yep. And those belly hatches, he's like, this is the number one problem with this thing. And there's no damn belly hatch. <laughs> that was one of the best things about a new driver was uh, when you, when you got a new, new Marine out there to the, you know, to the ramp and you're going through the, you know, kind of welcome on board. You know, you do little things to mess with the boots and stuff oh, yeah. like that. But because of that escape hatch, the driver's seat had a dump lever on it that would, if you hit it, the driver's seat would just dump out from underneath you and go up the side so that it basically cleared your path to the escape hatch. But nobody knows about it. They don't teach you that in tank school. So you would always tell them, okay, let's check the operation of the driver's seat. Okay, check up and down, check forward and back. Okay, check your T-bar. Okay, pull that red lever and then they pull it and dump themselves out of the third floor. <laughs> or I did, you know, the whole, it was just kind of one of those things you always did the new drivers <laughs> that's awesome so uh 1998 um this is kind of where i think a lot of your remainder of your of your career and and our conversation uh, previously you you alluded to this you know i uh, i've seen you speak quite a few times and, and every time i kind of come off just saying man that man can talk and you know i i asked you a question of, of where did you learn how to how to you know speak publicly you know did you take formal public speaking <laughs> and your answer was no i was a di <laughs> so so <laughs> typical marine corps fashion no i was a di i just i just toned it down a little bit so i mean that, that's a great answer um and then in 1998 like i said you, you went to di school uh where you were promoted to staff sergeant and uh you were at that point um you know obviously you learned some lessons being a di what uh what if, what, what has carried through all these years Drill instructor duty was the best leadership training. I know people say that a lot and all and all that. And uh, it, it was it was great leadership training as far as addressing things in you as a Marine, as far as you and how you lead, how you portray yourself, how you convey what you're trying to say, all those different sort of things. When I was graduating DI school, we had one last inspection in DI school. And, I, and I'll never forget this because the instructor asked me, and I never really thought about this. I never really thought about this question until he asked me he said what was the hardest thing about di school and i thought about it and i gave him i gave him an honest answer and i still think it's the most honest answer i could give to this day even with you know many years of hindsight to look at it and and try and analyze it and it was not having a weakness you can't have a weakness in anything and if you do you need to be addressing it it's okay to be bad in certain things but you damn sure better be fixing yourself mm. on whatever that is and so I'd say that was one of the biggest things as far as self-improvement. And then uh, with regard to drill instructor duty, I was very blessed that it just great teammates. You, I was in a great company and you could look at, you could look at the different companies and this is how I would always analyze a company because drill instructors are always tired. <laughs> that is long, long hours. And so drill instructors are always tired. They never look it, but they are. They're, they're always in a sleep deficit. And you could tell how good a company was when you watched them go put their recruits in a class, like at the House of Knowledge, because when the recruits are in class, 
you can finally you go and you can go rest for a little bit. That's a secret. Hopefully you don't have anybody, you know, I'm betraying a secret, but that's when <laughs> girls are asleep a little bit. And so when you pull your recruits in, when you pull your platoon in, if you're like one of the first platoons in, you're going to put them in the classroom and crappy companies, their drone says, will just go to the, go, go to lounge and go, go grab some, they'll leave somebody in there to mess with the recruits, but the other ones will go and grab some rest. Good companies like the one I was blessed to be in, those drills will turn around and they'll start, they'll start helping the next platoon come in. They'll start stressing their recruits. And then by the time that last platoon's pulling in, you get 20 drum instructors all going nuts on that last platoon. But that's people who are committed to the mission. No matter how tired they are, they're going to help out that other platoon. They're going to help out those other drill instructors. And it's, it's a very small, subtle thing. But I, I always thought that's, if you watch, watch a company, a recruit company go into the house of knowledge, and that's how you can tell whether they're a good company or not by how much they help each other, how committed they were to the mission or how much they just wanted to catch up on that sleep. Cause that's the only chance they're going to get. And uh, I was very blessed to be in one of those companies that was on the good side of all that. Uh, chain of command always took care of us because uh, there's rules for what you can and can't do with regard to recruits. And uh, hopefully again, I'm not betraying some, <laughs> some trade secret. And they had this great gunny who instructed that at the school. And the best way he described it, he said, the SOP, that's what they call the rule. Mm -hmm. The SOP is like the 55 mile an hour speed limit out on the freeway. Do you break it? Yeah, probably everybody does. Mm -hmm. If you go, if you're going 59 in a 55, are you going to get pulled over? Probably not, probably not ever. But if you get pulled over and a policeman writes you that ticket, do you got to pay it? Yes, you do. And he'd say, if you're one of those guys out there driving around hundred miles an hour every day, it's just a matter of time before you lose your license. <laughs> I use that. I use that little metaphor so many times about so many other things in life that it was just a great lesson for when you have rules that are very restrictive. And then they used to say another thing there that you've probably heard repeated many, many times. Michael Jordan, who was who would have been a name back then. Michael Jordan doesn't get to pick the rules of the NBA. He just finds a way to score thirty points a game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I always thought those two were just great. Uh, great ways to encapsulate drill instructor duty. No, that is, uh, that's, that's some of the best I've ever heard. Uh, and so you, you, you took that knowledge and then returned back to first tanks uh, in 2002 where you, where you were at Bravo company. And this is really kind of where it starts to uh, uh, take, take shape. Um, Cause at that point, you know, we already kind of knew. Generally <laughs> Can I speaking, tell you one little story on that one? Sure. <laughs> you, if you notice the, the bio I sent you, I only had one specific date on there that I could remember very clearly. And that was the date I reported back to first tanks because I was at, uh, I was on drill circuit duty when 9-11 happened. And I was at the end of my tour. I, I was already done pushing platoons and they got what they call quota, which is the guys who like teach the, uh, the classes. You know, there's other drill instructors there that are not in, not training platoons. They're on their third year of their three year tour. So they're, they're on what's called quota. I was on quota. I was done. Right. And I worked with the recruits who were being kicked out. I think it was my, my correctional officer background, they, they saw they saw a good use of my talents there. So I ran a little prison there on the, on the depot. Mm. And, but it's a very, uh, it, by the way, the, 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 it's called recruit separation platoon. RSP and receiving barracks fall under the same command. Our first sergeant used to say we were the mouth and butt of the regiment. <laughs> so I, I was the butt side of it. Right. And uh, so 9-11 happened. And I thought, you know, and I'd been a veteran of the Gulf War and the Gulf War was, you were kind of in or you were out. Mm -hmm. If you weren't in, if you weren't in a company that deployed, that, that, thing, that thing was over before, before the next round. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I didn't know what was going to happen out of this one, but I knew whatever it was, I wanted to be in it. And so I, <laughs> I went down to the regimental commander and I said, uh, well, first I went through my, my chain of command. And they were all saying, yeah, we can get you out of here. We can short, you know, get you out here a few months early. I mean, cause you're just on quota anyway. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it turned to, no, you're staying here until the end. And I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to get told no, I want this to come from the top. So I <laughs> went to a regimental commander's uh, office, knocked on his hatch and went in, pressed mission to speak and asked him uh, to leave, to go, go back to the first tank. So I think there's a war coming. I, I want to be out there. I want to, I want to be there. And he, that was one of the worst butt I ever got in the Marine Corps. <laughs> it was a pretty good one. And uh, 
And the next day they cut me orders to 36 months to the day. They made me do every last day of that, of that, of that tour. So that's the only reason I remember that date so specifically was they said I could leave on 30, uh, what's the, which are they? Uh, January, February, March, uh, 30 March, 31 March, how many days are in March? I reported in April 1st. I would, the next day I drove out to join on Falls, reported in. Wow. So you, uh, you came back to first tanks and uh, you were the platoon sergeant for second platoon of the invasion into Iraq in 2003. And this was, uh, this was Bravo company and uh, Bravo company did the march uh, up to Baghdad. And, and you, uh, you included in here uh, in your bio, um, some, some really, really prominent, notable engagements. Um, and I'm just going to run them off and let you kind of run with, uh, with, with, with the words. al uh, D Diwanyana, uh, al Kut the Diyala uh, River crossing. Uh, and then of course, uh, one of the things that made you most noticeable was pulling down the, uh, the Saddam statue. So uh, let's kind of start from, uh, from left to right and, and, and floor is yours. Yeah, the um, coming to Bravo, I checked into Bravo and uh, me and my platoon commander, my, you know, my, the guy I was going to work for, we checked in on the same day. So we're both kind of sizing each other up because we're getting ready. We, we know we're getting ready to go to war together. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're both checking in the company. So his name was Lieutenant McLaughlin. Good guy. Lieutenant Mack, I would call him. And, uh, you know, we're sizing each other up. And the company was doing uh, McMap training, which was a new thing back then. Mm-hmm. So General Mattis said he wanted the whole division up to green belts in, like, such and such time. So we're doing this McMap just constantly. And so uh, Lieutenant Mack, on this particular part, he's the attacker. And uh, Lieutenant Fleas, our XO, is a defender. They're both big old lieutenants. They're both six and a half footers, you know, Lieutenant Mack played college ball, uh, basketball, and Lieutenant Fleece is just a big old guy. So Mack comes at him, but he's all gangly because he's a basketball player. He's all elbows and knees, <laughs> and he go, he piles into Fleece, and he gets up, and he's bleeding from his mouth. And we're like, all right, ceasefire, sir. You know, we got to take a look at you. And he's missing his tooth. He's missing his front tooth. I'm like, oh, let's see if we can find it. And we look over Lieutenant Fleece, and he's bleeding from his forehead. And Max Tooth was embedded in, in Flea's forehead. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll follow this guy anywhere. This is my guy. <laughs> and uh, Lieutenant Mack was just a great guy. He's a great guy to work for. Uh, we had a great platoon. Uh, we fought in a pretty good fight in uh, Al Basra, which was uh, – I, what I really like about that one was uh, two tank kills, which is always a fun thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just – it was you could really see what that M1A1 could really do. I had a policy that I taught all my guys that uh, all the tank commanders was if we're retrograding and your, your wingman breaks down, then you stay because you're the forward element then and nobody's going to stay alone as a forward element. If for whatever reason we're going backward and your wingman breaks down or your other tank in your section breaks down, you stay. Nobody stays alone. But if we're going forward and your wingman breaks down, well, then they just got to find an 88 and they'll catch up when they catch up because this thing will cut. We're going to cover 500 miles before it's all said and done. It's going to move really fast. Mm-hmm. So on this, this first night, Al Basra is our first objective. It's right there. Uh, there's a bridge, bridge that overlooking that goes into Basra. And our job was to take that area and then hold that bridge, make sure nothing's coming out of Basra to, to backdoor the, the division as it's coming out because that's right there on the border. And so when we get up to that, uh, we're on our way to that bridgehead, we, we were on the wrong road. We're a little bit north of where we were supposed to be because, you know, we attack with zero moon and it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of hard to land mass. So we're a little bit north of where we're supposed to be. We turn around and we're more retrograding. My wingman, uh, Palacios, gets mired down. So when Palacios' tank gets stuck down, he had a big mine plow on the front too. Mm-hmm. I stop with him because now we're with a forward element. Right. And then our company commander decides, okay, we're still going to keep going down this road even though it's the wrong one. So when we turn back around, now all of a sudden I find myself in the front of the company, which is pretty good, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's so I'm up front with the company commander and we look off in that thermal site and there's just a beautiful T-54-55 flank to us because we were on the wrong road from where they thought we were going to come. Huh. We, were, we were to their side. We're yeah. looking right at the flank of this beautiful T-54-55. And then, we, then I scan to, his, to, to the left of that one. There's another one. There's two of them mm-hmm. sitting there. And they're hot. They're warmed up. They're running. They're they're waiting for us to come on that other road. So I radio the company commander, and he's you know he's he's very concerned about fratricide and stuff like that. Captain Lewis, he says, "Are you sure?" I said, "It looks like an AFBID slide. It's beautiful." And uh, count the road wheels. 
Because <laughs> you can see everything. Gap between first and second row, we don't pull back around. Yeah, you can see the drum row. It was beautiful. It was it was lit up just bright. And uh, you know, and so he says, "You sure?" I said, "Yeah." And then he then he sees it. And he knows what it is. He says, "Okay, let's cross bar. Let's get them both." Mm-hmm. And so he counts us down three, two, one, and we gun smoke. They're fifteen hundred meters. Very you know, very more than anyone. This is that's a free throw. So we hit those two. And then we hit those two, and they went up pretty catastrophically. Mm-hmm. All these infantry started running out. They were, there was a couple hundred infantry that were, that were in, you know, in trenches and stuff. We never seen them until the two tanks went up. And then they started running. So we're machine gunning them down, and we're closing on them, closing on them. And I, and I, I had a lot of 60 habits that I fought with. I always fought open hatch. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm out of the hatch. I'm looking through my night vision and everything. And my gunner, who is just a great gunner, this guy, Corporal Schroeder, and uh, Shorter keeps traversing back. He keeps going off these infantry. And, he, you know, he's, he's been machine gunning down. Then he keeps going off them. And he keeps going back to the left tank of those two tanks. And he says, Staff Sergeant, there's another tank. And I'm looking with the naked eye. I'm looking right down the gun. And he's looking right at the flaming tank. And I'm like, Gunner, you're looking at the one you just shot. You can't tell because you're looking through thermal. You, mm-hmm. you, you're, you're looking at it. It's a dead tank. And I take him off and I put him back on the infantry. And I, you know, keep engaging so he keeps engaging, and he'll, he'll only do it for like a few bursts, and he'll go right back to that tank. Mm-hmm. And I, I did this like three times, you know, where I took him off and I put him back in the empty. He's like, and he's getting more emphatic each time. Stabs are, there's, a, there's another tank right there. Mm-hmm. And so I, my, my first instinct was to kind of wrap him on the head a little bit with my, with my boot. But I thought, let me check it out. And I went into my extension. Oh, my God, there was another one. There was a third one right in the, wow. right in the low ground, right behind him. And the, I couldn't see him because the one was burning right between right. me and him. And so we hit him and we were like, we, we were about 200 meters from him when I hit him. And the company commander was probably about 50 meters from him mm-hmm. when I hit him. And when we hit him, he went up so big that the, the tank leader thought the company commander's tank had just gotten hit because the company commander's tank was like 50 meters from it. And it was a tremendous explosion. Okay. And uh, I think it was just, uh, it's just amazing how good this tank was because through this all, because they were working off infrared and everything else when we shot the first two they had no idea we were even there right. you know the first two we could have sat there and planned it for a week before we shot and they, they had no idea they couldn't see us couldn't hear us nothing so um yeah great gunner though corporal schroeder and uh i just want to tell you about another uh, two other can i tell you two other corporal schroeder stories of just great gunner hey you're, you're the guest man <laughs> okay it's, it's your time so schroeder this guy he he could shoot it, 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 we were we were in one of those fights in Al Coop. We got an uh, ambush from the right flank. We were on a column, we were in a staggered column on a on a uh, on a road like a divided highway, and we're going along. And he, I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but if you if somebody shoots very close to you and that tank, you can't hear it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you got your comm helmet on, engines running, all that stuff. But it, it'll look like a camera flash, you know. Mm-hmm. So I see it's like camera flash. Right? I think we're being engaged. And uh, then they then they hit the side of the turret with a spray of machine gun, and what, they were in a they were in a, a palm grove. And as the column came by, they let about three or four tanks get out past. We were in the lead, so I was the fourth tank. They started the engagement with with my tank, mm-hmm. and then they hit the company commander behind me. They hit the XO. They hit our our battalion commander, who was in a soft skin vehicle, destroyed his vehicle. And then we all turned into the into the ambush site. And I, I'll I'll spare. I just want to tell you about the one shot that Corporal Schroeder makes in this. Mm-hmm. So we push the tank into the palm grove, and it's pretty tight. There's there's three APCs right there, and he hits the three of them. I hit him with main gun because mm-hmm. that that really unnerves the, the, the <laughs> enemy infantry watching these three APCs go up with, on from main gun. And then we're pushing through there, and we got an impact round stuck in the tube. And I don't know if you ever experienced that, yep. but the impacts on the M1A1, the service ones, would really get stuck in that tube, and it was just easier to shoot them out than to try and try and uh, do anything with them. So the XO who's behind me says, I, I, I see some across the palm grove. I can't get a shot at them because it's really thick trees and all that. And I go to where he's talking about, and I can see metal, mm-hmm. metal through the trees, but I can't make it. It's about 200 meters across the palm grove. And so because, we, because it's not a sable round, he's going to have to get a clear shot. Because if it is a tree between us and them, it's not going to right. make it. Because it's point, point and issue based at me. So he goes to his auxiliary side. He's the guy in the drive. Okay, back up, back up, back up, back up forward, forward, forward. And he's, he's, I mean, he's got 200 meters of trees that he's trying to get this one, you know, Alleyway. this one 
eye of a needle shot through all these trees so that that impact's actually going to make it. And he, he lines it up and he squeezes it off. And as soon as we squeeze it off, Lieutenant Mack, who's on the far side, uh, the, this the guy I was talking about earlier with the tooth in the head, Lieutenant Mack is on the far side. And he's like, target, that was a T-62. It was a T-62 sitting in a revetment. And that Impact K killed it. Impact wow. K killed it. <laughs> and if, if they wouldn't have seen it, when we came out of the Palm Grove, they'd have been looking right at our flank. And nobody would have mm. seen them if the XO wouldn't have picked them up. Man. Great shot. Last one I'm going to tell you about Schroeder. <laughs> so we're, we're, you can cut these out if this gets too verbal. <laughs> nah, man, this is awesome. This is, this is what the channel is all about. Are you kidding me? So we're, it's a bath party like uh, – bath party like headquarters or something like that. I don't know whatever reason we're going to clear it. it's full it's got bad guys in it we're going to clear it. so I got my tank there and we're working with 340 we're attached to 340 at the mm -hmm. time so 340 got a squad they're all lined up at the door and I'm about 20 meters I'm really close to it well I'm probably about 50 meters you know it's enough that we can use the site without too much parallax mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm picturing shorter you know because that machine gun holds like 3,000 in the bin you know, I'm talking, you know, when I'm, when I'm turning loose with this machine gun, I wanted to take the whole door off the hinges. I wanted to just fill that room full of lead. The, the infantry's all stacked up, ready to go in there. And I'm like, all right, sure, to take that door off. And he does this two-round burst. <laughs> what? He does another two-round burst. And, I, and now I'm winding my foot up because I'm getting ready to wrap him in the back of the right. head. I'm just mad at him, you know. And he does it. Before he can swing that foot, he does that third burst. And there was a padlock on that door. And he hit the padlock with that machine gun and <laughs> blew it off the door. That's what he was trying to do. That's why he was just doing those little bursts. <laughs> I was like, holy crap, nice shot. And then the amateur guys just walk up, open the door, and then they went in. <laughs> what, what a shot. Schroeder, Schroeder was always like that. He, that dude could shoot. He was a, just a good guy, too. I had a, had a good crew on that one. And, uh, I, I've, I've always been blessed, always been blessed with good crews that, uh, I mean, you know, our community, our right. community is just top to bottom with so many good people that it's, uh, you know, where do you stop? Where do you stop as far as um, the praise? Yeah. So before, before I get into uh, what, it, what it's like to command two tanks uh, in combat, two different tanks uh, variants, um, let's, let's talk about the, uh, the picture, the one that, the one that made you famous. Um, sure. And obviously the one you used on the cover of your book, uh, Winter Marine. Um, great book, by the way. Uh, been on the Commandant's list for you know a long time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, very proud of that. Absolutely, should be. And uh, so there you are. Uh, you know, how, how did how did the tanks get there to topple down the statue? Did they, did they call for the for the, uh, for the for the 88? Well, we were we were just taking ground because like when we first got to Baghdad. The people went nuts when we first got there that they were looting everything in sight. It okay. was like a, it, it, the people all over in the streets. And we were kind of on the, on the outskirts of town. We were like, we were in that first like kind of ring of Baghdad. We were across the Diyala River, so we were into Baghdad. But it was uh, kind of suburban. Uh, people were looting everything. And then the day after that, they all just disappeared. They all just went underground. It was really mm -hmm. bizarre. And I think because... You know, now they're seeing Americans in their capital city and they know life's getting ready to change and they don't know in what way. So right. they just hid. They just all went underground. And so the streets were just deserted. So we just get movement orders and we're just taking ground. So we're rolling through these streets and they're absolutely, and they're just deserted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we're rolling up on Ferdo Square. I didn't know it was Ferdo Square at the time or anything like that. I could just see a big statue of Saddam Hussein at the end of the street. I remember I snapped a picture. I, I'll send you that picture. You know, we're rolling down the street and we got to the, we got to the square. It wasn't a square, it's a circle. Mm -hmm. And we just went around it and just set a defensive to wait for the next frag or just wait for our next, you know, our next order, whatever it was going to be. I was on the Tigris River side. And I'm just looking, just oriented out at the river. And... Uh, this the statue is in the middle, but I, I thought a lot about this later, and I think what happened was it took on a symbolism to the people, and the people saw this because because back then everywhere you went had Saddam images. Every you know every room had a picture of him in it, mm -hmm. you know every town had a statue of him. There were murals of him everywhere, and they were symbols to the people that the the dictator and the secret police are always watching you. You don't step out, you know you know you don't step out of line here you know, secret police come and get you. And so to the people, I think they saw that and they saw this image and it was surrounded by Americans. 
and it, it, it took on more of a symbolism than, than anything else. And the people started coming out. And when they came out to our perimeter, you know, we were very cognizant. You better win these people over. 25 million people, they're not on your side. You're going to lose, you know. So you got to make sure you, you keep the people on your side. And so they were met with handshakes of friends. You know, Marines and Marines welcomed them and said, yeah, come on in. And they, they started coming into the square. And then before long, they had hundreds of them in there just celebrating. And they, you know, and they started messing with the statue because to them, they couldn't get away with that before we got there. So now they're disrespecting the statue and all that. And then a kid walked up to the M88, um, Gunny uh, Lambert. Gunny Lambert was commanding the M88. <laughs> the kid said, uh, Mr. Mister, can you help us tear down the statue? And so Gunny fired up the M88. They rolled out there. They threw the boom out. Uh, Corporal Chin, he was my platoon mechanic, just a great guy. Uh, Eddie Chin goes up the boom. He nooses up Saddam. The flag that he put over his head, that one came from my platoon commander, Lieutenant Matt. They said, uh, let's put up an American flag. And uh, Mac's got one, because Mac, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a backstory. Mac, uh, Mac went to the Pentagon to work after tank school because he broke his leg, you know, because you can't have a lieutenant checking in on light duty. You know, we'd all make fun of him. So, you know, he, had, he went to the Pentagon to rehab his leg. And then during that time, that's when the Pentagon was hit on 9-11. He was there, part of the rescue and relief. And when he got his orders to first tanks, they folded up the American flag from the Marine detachment there and they gave it to Lieutenant Mack and said, Hey, you get the bag there, find somewhere nice to put that. And that's the one that went over wow. Saddam's head. I think Mack did a, did a most meritorious job with that. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so that's the flag that went over his head and then they pulled the statue down. And I, I, I mean, just watching those people, it was, it was nuts. They were just, they were celebrating. They were, Oh, I skipped over the whole cigar thing, the mm -hmm. picture. <laughs> Is he talking about the statue? So uh, my company commander, Captain Lewis, he comes over to my tank and he's got a he's, he wants to use my radius. He's on the deck. He's on mm. he's on foot walking around the walking around the square there, and he's smoking a cigar. And he comes up to my tank and he says, "Hey, Papa, they use your radios." I said, "Show what freak you want, sir." And he said, I think you want to talk to the battalion or whatever. So mm. I put the freak on the radio so he could use it. And why? And then when he took the grunt phone to use it, he just handed me a cigar. And so, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not one to pass up on that. Right. So I started puffing on it, and that's when the guy snapped the photo. It wasn't even my cigar. It was Cam Lewis's that's cigar. That's crazy. <laughs> that's when he snapped the photo of me with that, with the statue in the background. And that thing, uh, when we were on the boat coming home from that deployment, we were on the USS Boxer. And uh, you guys were coming up to me, giving me a hard time because that photo made it on the front page of Marine Corps Times. Heck yeah, dude. It was all over the place. It still is. You, you still Google it. It's still out there. Absolutely. With, it also was uh, cigar aficionado. I guess they found out yeah. who I was and they sent me boxes of cigars for like for, yeah. it was a pretty good amount of time. So we were, yeah. me and my buddies were smoking like these hundred dollar cigars and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, all, all up a loner, you know. Right. And uh, the guy who took the photo, later on I was walking around the square and he walked up to me. He was a French guy, a French mm -hmm. uh, journalist. And he said, uh, you made me a lot of money today, my friend. I said, really, how'd I do that? And he told me about the picture mm. that he put it out on well, however it is they do it and everybody was buying it. Right. And I said, okay, well, you obviously got satellite communications. I said, uh, I'm gonna give you a phone number. I said, I want you to, why don't you call this number. It was my home phone number. Mm. And the lady who picks up the phone, tell her to watch this stuff on TV. Because you know, <laughs> I could see all the journalists. I figured it was on TV back in the right. States. And he said, call her yourself, my friend. And he gave me a satellite phone. And uh, he had to show me how to dial it. I had no idea how to dial a satellite <laughs> phone. So he showed me how to dial it. And I called my wife from, uh, from Ferno Square That's cool. when all that was happening. And uh, it, was, it was just, you know, you get a lot of good days in the Marine Corps. That one yeah. was, that is a pretty damn good day. Absolutely. Good day. So I, I, pr I promised a question. We're going to go back to it. So you, you are probably, you're probably the only person that I know of that has, commanded both the M60 and the M1A1 in combat operations with, with, with K kills on, on enemy, on enemy tanks. I mean, I, I, I believe that you're probably the only person I know um, who has that experience right now. What, what do you, what are the similarities and what are the differences? I guess like, like capes and limbs of each one of the vehicles. You know, we joked about the belly hatch, but I mean, I know there's capes and limbs of each. The M60 is, uh, it, when, when we were talking about Camp Pendleton and uh, 29 Palms, the one thing I noticed, the big difference in the tankers from when I got out on the M60 tank to when I, when I came back in on the M1A1 was the, the use of terrain was kind of a less, a less done thing on the M1A1. And, and probably as a result, the armor is just so much better. 
Whereas the M60 tank, we did a lot more sneaking around. You did a lot more keeping that tank down below the down below the terrain line, keeping it as low as you could. And th that was something we did on Camp Pendleton because the terrain was so hilly. But you were always taught that I mean, this tank's eight feet high. If you can get it one foot lower, one out of eight rounds that would hit you is now going to miss you. Mm -hmm. You know, and little things like that. So we were always our drivers were always trained how to stay low out of that. And with the M1A one, you more stood out in the open and just punched it out with people. And then. That, there's something to be said for that, too, because when we fought in Fallujah on that M1A1, I mean, I, they would just hit that tank with, with RPG rounds. <laughs> we'd, we'd just sit there and just laugh. I mean, it, yeah. it really just soaked them up. It just, it just doesn't do nothing to that tank, whereas on the M60 tank, you, you could potentially get penetrated depending on where you get hit with that RPG-7. So you, you spend a lot more time very conscious of the terrain. And it's so funny. I still do that to this day, like when, you know, when we're driving down the freeway. It's, it's so funny because I just I instinctively do that. I just look at the side of the road and I'm always looking for hold downs and turret and stuff like that. So much so I've got her doing it now because it's just such an instinctive habit of mine, always looking for where I would take a tank if I was driving in that terrain. But so that was a big difference. And the, uh, the 60 was a lot more, a lot less cruise survivability. That wasn't a big thing. Like, uh, like for instance, the turret floor on the M60 tank, you had 13 rounds that just sat on the turret floor. There was a little retention system for them, but <laughs> that's where you kept your sables. You had 13 sable rounds just standing upright on the turret floor. You had three white phosphorus rounds that were right there by the loader's shin. Mm. You, there, there was no ammo door. You know, if you if you got hit in that tank, you probably you need to get out of it pretty quick because that tank's going to be on fire. And uh, so there was a lot of that going on to where you didn't, you didn't think you could just stand there and punch it out with people like you did on the M1A1. M1A1, you feel pretty emboldened to just stand there toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about anything on the battlefield. So that's different. How quick you can get somewhere, that's when we got, when we were on the 60 tank, we used to look at the Amtraks and think, man, I wish, I wish our stuff went that fast. <laughs> and, now, and now in the M1, you're waiting for those things. Right. You know, so it's, it's so much more automotively impressive. But now here's the difference. That M60 tank did not break down. You, that thing, you could have a blown jug, a, a you know, a cylinder. You, you could have a thrown rod down there mm -hmm. in that thing, and it was still going to keep running. Mm -hmm. and, those, and those 385 gallons of fuel it held would take you a long, long way. So you didn't have to see the, the log train every day on that M60 tank mm -hmm. like you did on the M1A1. And it didn't break down on you because everything was, uh, was hardwired, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Like when it applied super elevation, it, it, it was literally cranking it on there. It was just a math equation. It was, it was going to, it was going to take the range and use the, the, we called it a ballistic computer it really was a gearbox mm -hmm. and it was going to use whatever type round to how much super elevation it was going to put on that gun. It didn't do it all electronically like the MNA one does, but subsequently your gunners had to be a lot more skilled. So like you, you had to, uh, you had to apply, it was rifle barrel. So the rounds would drift. Mm -hmm. So like if you were shooting a 3,000 meter shot, you had to aim off to the left because the round was going to spin because it was a rifle barrel and it was going to mm -hmm. drift right. So you had to aim off to the left. It didn't have a cant sensor. So if it was on a cant, you're going to have to aim up and up and opposite because mm -hmm. the, the, the cant sensor, there's no cant sensor. So it's going to apply super elevation mm -hmm. just in the up and down plane, even if the right. tank wasn't up and down. So little things like that that you had to know as a gunner, you had to be very skilled on how to how to hit things and a biggie is range because range is a hit or miss on a tank that's right. that's a biggie so how quickly you can range and at m60 tank had what was called a coincidence range finder so when you looked in your your uh tank commander site you saw two images and you cranked it till you had one image and what it was doing it was using two different things to figure out the range using right. isosceles triangle some kind of geeky i love that stuff <laughs> but with the m1a1 LRF, boom, instantaneous range. So, I mean, the capability of that M1A1 is phenomenal. Survivability, phenomenal. I mean, look at me. I got hit in the head with an RPG, slit the top of the tank on fire, not a burn mark on me. I didn't have a single burn on me. You know, all that stuff works exactly as advertised. You know, so, I mean, it's, uh, hey, I'm, I'm a big fan of it, big fan of it. It was just uh Took me took me a few years experience to learn how to keep it running. That was the hardest <laughs> part in the beginning. Yeah. So uh, after returning stateside from uh, from that very very uh, you know influential and, and really 
historic deployment because I mean, those images went, like you said, went around the world um, and it really became kind of the face of that, of that particular battle. You transferred to Charlie company as a platoon sergeant for first platoon and then redeployed to Iraq. So now, you know, you're, you're the cigar Marine. Um, you're now a gunnery sergeant and uh, you were, you were chopped out to, uh, to two one in support of Fallujah. And uh, uh, I hopefully, so, uh, you know, obviously you'd mentioned that the, uh, the M1A1 did its job. Um, you know, and, and there's no, there's no secret here that, that you were wounded. Um, what, what, what was the situation that kind of set that up? I mean, I, I know, I know you've written a book on it and things and, and but you know, hearing it from you personally, I think is, is very valuable. Yeah. If, if you'd asked me before I got hit to like make a mental picture of how you, how you're, you're going to get wounded, make a mental picture of how it's going to happen. I probably would have pictured something pretty similar to what happened. Uh, a lot of good guys shoot, a lot of bad guys shoot, and every once in a while, one of bad guys gets a good shot. And it, it's really as simple as that. But to, to kind of, you know, be in more detail, uh, we were leading an attack. We we were in the Jolan district of Fallujah. The battle hadn't actually even started, and we sent a security patrol in, and the security patrol got hit, and then so we came in as a response to this, uh, to basically allow the medevac of the wounded members of the security patrol. And once we got in the city, because nobody else was in the city yet, we were still shaping the battlefield. We, we were still doing the cordon. We hadn't started the battle yet. But, so because we were the only thing in the city, the bad guys were coming out in droves to fight us. And it was me and my wingman uh, commanded by Sergeant Escamilla. And the bad guys were just coming out. And so we were, we were putting them down and we, and we were having a lot of success in there. And so the company commander had us just keep moving. I just kept taking ground, kept taking ground. And uh, I mean, dude, we, we stayed in there for, geez, probably about 36 hours before I got hit. And the whole time we're just, the, the enemy just keeps coming out, coming out, coming out. And we're just taking ground. We had a platoon of infantry with us. So on the day I got hit, we started that day. I was set because we were almost out of fuel again. The M1A1, you know, we we're very low on fuel, and because uh, we've been operating all day and all night, so we were, we were getting low on fuel. We were we were getting low on ammunition, but they ran ammunition in, which was pretty neat, you know, because they asked me if I need a resupply. And usually, when you're attached to infantry, if they don't work with you a lot, mm. you tell them you need fuel, they're going to bring a couple five gallon jugs. Right. You know, <laughs> and if you tell me you need ammo, they're going to bring you like a couple of boxes. boxes. And you're like, no, yeah. no, this thing holds a lot. <laughs> and it's going to shoot a lot but these guys were pretty good so they were they were running in and it, it was like Guadalcanal style you know they had infantry guys running in in pairs and each one of them haul, hauling a crate you know with the pairs like each side holding one side of the crate right. and they were running in because there was a lot of enemy contact so they couldn't bring like a truck or nothing like that in there so they brought me a lot of ammo and uh, we were cross-decking a lot from Escamilla's tank to my tank because you know because he was behind me so the more of the shooting was coming from the front tank and so we got ammo to me that morning, but I didn't have fuel. So we were sitting there uh, relatively static, which is the first time we've done that since we've been in the city. And so the enemy started, started taking pot shots at us, you know, started to get a little bolder because we weren't moving to them. Mm -hmm. And that was one thing about this counterinsurgency. You always want to keep the initiative, but in this particular case, we didn't have the initiative because we were, we were waiting. Actually, it was the other tent, the other section of my platoon was going to come in and relieve us, but the lieutenant threw track outside town. So we were we were basically just static. We didn't have the fuel to go in the go in the offensive. Right. And I had a platoon of infantry to my to my left, and they, you know they started getting bolder, bolder. They, they shot a rocket that went right between me and my loader, Lance Borden, has went right between our, our heads that morning. So we're like we we might want to do something here because they're starting to get they're starting to get a little more on target here. And uh, it, was, it was funny because Hernandez was, he was such a good guy. And uh, when that rocket went right between us, I mean, we looked at each other and said, I can't believe that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> right between the tank commander and the loader. I can't believe it didn't hit Escamillo, who was right behind me. It didn't hit him either. And uh, so then our infantry spots a squad size element gathering, right? They're like one block up and two blocks over there, right over there, but they can see them from the rooftops. So I radio the company commander and he said, Yeah, go get them. So we go, we go, and I hit them. I hit them right outside the mosque. I think they use those mosques like staging points. So they really know them. We hit them right outside the mosque. We put half of them down, but the other half get away. And they're around the corner. So then we had a decision: though, are we going to pursue, or are we going to just go back and sit static? And I never want to sit static, so I said we'll pursue. 
So we're pursuing them down this block and the block's getting narrower and narrower and narrower. But we're still chewing them up with these machine guns, but I couldn't, couldn't do no more main gun. I couldn't even traverse my turret anymore. It was that tight. And we're doing a lot of, uh, as it's tightening down, we're doing a lot of loaders doing machine gun into those second story windows. I'm doing my, I keep my M16 up there. So I'm doing a lot of M16 in the second story windows. It's really tight. And we're heading into a cross street. And so I take my loader, Hernandez, and I put him down below the armor line. I hunker down, you know, I get in that alligator mode where I just got the eyes up above that cuckoo ring. And I head into the intersection because, you know, they're probably going to hit me from the flanks when I hit that intersection. Mm -hmm. I go into the intersection, I scan to my right, and there's one up on a rooftop. And he's, uh, he's got an RPG and he's in a good firing position. He's looking right at the flank of the tank. And he squeezes that shot off and it hits the side of the turf. But, you know, it doesn't do nothing to anyone. anyone. Just sort of, it hits the side of the turf, doesn't do nothing. And then I stop the tank and I'm slewing the 50 over when I heard that second hiss. And it was, there was another one. He used to about my four o'clock. I've never seen him. And I'm just figured he used to about my four o'clock just based on what, where it hit. But uh, he shot a rocket from, a, from about a third story rooftop because it came from up top. And it hit... Uh, Hit my hit my cupola ring, hit, hit hit my helmet, cupola ring, everything. All I know was I heard a hiss. So it's <laughs> when I, I I did know what hit me. I knew it was an RPG hit me because I remember hearing the hiss. And uh, but what I saw was I just saw a blinding white flash of light, like a camera flash, like a really intense one. And then uh, nothing. I didn't then just blackness. I didn't see anything. I mean, what had happened was uh, it had blown up and a piece of shrapnel had gone through my head and um, took this eye out and knocked the other eye, knocked the bottom out of my other eye socket. And so my other eye was down in my sinus cavity, apparently. And, um, but amazingly enough, I was still conscious, you know, I was still awake. So I, I just know I was, I was on the turf floor and I was, uh, I was, you know, I couldn't see anything and I couldn't hear anything. And I reached up and I felt my, my face and it was all wet. So I knew I was bleeding pretty badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I stood up and I started looking for Chambers, my gunners, but I'm in cool Chambers. And I'm like, Chambers, and I'm looking for him in that turret, but in his gunner's position, but he's not there. Right. And I guess probably from the second I got hit to when I got back on my feet, a little bit of time had passed, maybe, you know, more. It seemed kind of instantaneous to me, but it was enough time for the gunner to see the gunny bleeding to death on that turret mm -hmm. floor and leave his position and go up and get up in that cupola ring because we're sitting there static. We're sitting there stopped in an intersection because that was the last command I gave that driver's driver stop so I could fire at 50. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I used to drill into these guys over and over and over was if you get hit, move. Because if you get hit and you stay there, you're going to get hit again and yeah. again and again. They're going to light that tank on fire. They're going to do whatever they got to do. If you get hit, the one thing you need to do is move because you're going to get hit again. And so he got up and he got in, that, got in that cupola and Hernandez got back up on his machine gun and those two Marines push forward right through that, right through that intersection. And uh, the, the thing that there's like a couple of things that I remember about that, because uh, we don't, we don't, obviously we don't carry Corman on the tanks mm -hmm. and I'm bleeding pretty bad. I had holes in my neck, you know, in my head. It's, this is more than just, you know, the, this is, this is more just, you know, one of those, what are those, those the, uh, socks? Yeah, yeah, it's more than that. It's, <laughs> it's going to require a little bit of, a little bit of professional attention. Yeah. And so they got to get me to a medevac site, but we were operating as a tank section. Mm -hmm. we, we don't even have a company element to call, nothing like mm -hmm. that. So they're trying to figure out what do we do, you know? And uh, my driver, Lance Cobo Frias, he says, I know the way. And uh, Frias got us to the medevac site, which is, yeah, he did 19 years old, one year out of, one year out of high school. That was his first combat tour, it was in Fallujah. And that's varsity. Yeah, and they got me to the, uh, the medevac site. And it's funny because there's a video to that, that uh, some, because the medevac site was actually outside the city because nobody was in the city at that point, other than my tank section and one platoon of infantry. Mm -hmm. So they took me back out to the Fox company perimeter, Fox company two one. And I remember like a couple of days ago when we left there, they just dropped off all the pool photographers, right? In this pen that was very near my tank's position mm -hmm. because they weren't letting no embeds or nothing like that go in the city. There's, you know, the city was, this is going to be a pretty bad battle. Right. So they, when I saw the video of my tank coming out of Fallujah, they saw this later, you know, after the hospital and all that, I realized it must have been somebody sitting in that pen, pulled out their camera and shot some video of it. Mm. And so I see like what happens when I got to the, when I got to the medevac site 
And uh, I come out of the turret and I'm, you know, I'm bleeding like crazy and stuff. And, and there's a couple of things that really amazed me about that when I watched this video. Because for one is I could hear the driver put that tank in a two minute cool down, which I thought, man, that is awesome that he did that. I could hear, I could hear Frias do the two minute cool down on the tank. And then uh, Hernandez comes out. He's bleeding pretty bad. Both those guys got wounded as well from that grenade. So Hernandez comes out. He's bleeding pretty bad. He's going to get, get stitched up. Chambers comes out. He's wounded, but he's trying to get the gunny out of there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny because when I remembered it, you know, we, we will practice evacuate crewmen, you know, wounded crewmen, stuff like that. So I figured all I got to do is just get up to the ring here and people are just going to haul me out of here. And it's good. Right. <laughs> I'm sitting there like waiting, what's going on? Because I can't see nothing. Right. And really what's going on is they're, they're, they're coming up. It's just taking a little longer than I, than I can remember in my mind, you know. And they took me down. They got me on the deck. They're working on me, you know, and I'm, I'm sick to my stomach from, from, uh, they, from a head wound. You know, I get pretty right. good head wound, so I'm, I'm just nauseous. Right. And uh, this corpsman's working on me, and he's asking me questions, and he's like, hey, Gunny, Mary, where are you from? You got kids? And all that. And I know what he's doing. You know, he's trying to reassure the casualty. He's trying to keep me from going into mm -hmm. shock, you know, because we do the same thing when I'm treating somebody else. Right. So, you know, I, I know what he's doing. I said, look, Doc, I said, I know what you're doing. I said, I'm fine. I'm not in any pain whatsoever. I'm not going to go into shock. The only thing hurting me right now is talking to you because I'm sick to my stomach. I'm <laughs> nauseous. Yeah. And he says, it's cool, Gutty, it's cool, you know, and he just keeps working on me. And I remember just feeling so good at that point mm -hmm. because I just knew he was good. I, I knew if we got there, I was good to go. I knew I wasn't going to die. I wasn't gonna nothing. When we're doing the trip back there. I'm real sleepy and stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, don't go to sleep. You go to sleep, that's how you die. Right. But now that we're here, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm at the home team now. Everything's mm -hmm. going to be fine. And so while he's doing that, you know, and I'm feeling really good, then I guess it must have been another Cormac came over and just started yelling like crazy at him. You know, he's like, I thought I told you to talk to him. And he's screaming at him, you know. <laughs> and so this guy, you don't want to get yelled at no more. He's like, hey, Gunny, where are you from? You married? You got kids? You know? <laughs> and I, you know, so I tried to answer him and then I threw up right. all over these guys. Yeah. I did. I let him go. And then, uh, and then, you know, there's a lot of things you, I remember about this and this one I'll never forget. Mm -hmm is uh, then it felt like it felt like they were burying me like they were trying to put me under the ground like i mean it really felt like they were trying to bury me and what they were taking off every you know their their ballistic cloth their flak jackets mm -hmm. their helmets everything and piled it on me and i said what are you doing and they said we're being mortar attacked honey and they were they were stripping off all their own crap wow to protect me i, that's, I mean that's that's zero for a moment stuff man that's courage yeah. honor commitment right there for sure and uh yeah, and then from there on in, then things move pretty quick after that. Then it's a lot of, uh... <laughs> well, okay, one, one more little thing about that. When I got to the animal hospital, which is the, what we call the, the surgical unit there in Fallujah, I'm, I'm assuming that's where they took me. You know, and it, it, I, they're working and all this stuff. And then everything got really quiet, like it just stopped. And they said, uh, and a voice, a voice talked to me, he says, how you doing, Marine? I said, good, who's asking? And he said, General Hagee, it was the commandant. Wow. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, and I was, I was so amazed that it was the commandant that was there. Right. You know, and uh, yeah, so I met the commandant. I don't, don't remember much more than that, but met the commandant. So then, then you transferred from, uh, from uh, Germany to Bethesda and then to Balboa, back to San Diego. Then to Balboa. Palms. Yeah. So yep. a lot, a lot of, back uh, home. A lot of trips and then ultimately re medically retired um, June 30th, 2005. Yeah, and uh, if I did this one, they never quite got all the eyesight, you know, or even like a majority of it back into this one. Mm -hmm. If this one would have seemed just fine, I, you know, who knows? Well, I'd be past my thirty-year mark now, but but maybe I'd have kept pulling triggers. But with this one, uh, couldn't get enough eyesight back into this one to to stick around and do anymore. So, so it was time personal to question on. time. All right, personal yeah. question. Where, where where did you get the eagle of an anchor uh, eye and then also the radical eye? Like how how does one go eye shopping? Okay, so when I first got hit, I had a lot of shrapnel on my face and stuff like that. And the one one of the things when you get nerve damage in your face, a lot of shrapnel will do. Mm -hmm. It makes all your teeth feel loose. Mm -hmm. And so I kept griping in the hospital. I kept saying, hey, I need to see a dentist. I, my my teeth are all loose. And they told me, they said, no, no, they said, uh, that's just, it's nerve damage. They feel loose, but they're, they're all fine. We checked them. Your teeth are fine. 
you know, just all your teeth feel loose. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've been home probably about four or five months, enough that, you know, kind of every, the stitches are all closing up and all that. And I got a, um, a appointment sent to me to report to dental. And I told him, I said, no, no, I said, I said that's because I've been saying my teeth loose, they're not loose, it's nerve damage. I don't know. They said, that's, that's the prosthetics lab. I said, really? He said, glass eyes are made by dentists. I didn't know that. But I had no idea. Yeah, because the material that they're made out of is the same thing a dental bridge is made out of, same thing a skull implant. Okay. It's all the same material. So they have dentists that make it, and they're dental techs. They're, they're petty officers. They're, they're, you know, they're E4s, E5s. Right. And you spend a lot of time with them. So yeah, I got to know them pretty good, you know, because they, they got to paint your eye and they, they, mm -hmm. they, they, to make your eye look like your other eye, it's a kind of a detailed job. Mm -hmm. So you spent a lot of time with them. And I got to know him pretty good. So this guy, Doc Cruz, I said, hey, Doc, I said, this is going to sound like a weird one. I said, but here goes. So I was a tank commander on the fleet. I said, can you make me a glass eye? Instead of looking like this, can you make me one that looks like a tank sight, like a crosshair? And he said, I don't know. And he walked out of the room, and I'm thinking they're going to come back in and say, get lost, Jared. We ain't doing no crap like that. And they come in. There's a whole pack of them, a whole gang of them. And they got their medical officer with them and everything. And this guy named Dr. David. And Dr. David's like, hey, maybe we put a watch battery in it and make it glow. And they, had, they were all excited about it. <laughs> so I went and got a uh, – I wasn't – uh, at all computer savvy. So I went and got my, what's what they call it, 17-12-2. Mm -hmm. I went and got my little tank fork and I brought it to him and I said, hey, that, that's what I want to have, yeah. you know, the, the M30, what the M32 uh, Gunner's primary sight. And they did all red yeah. and uh, they put it in. It, did, it didn't last long though, because that one eventually got, got some trunnion cans in it and it got like sideways. It, it, your, your eye socket will kind of change over the, over the time. And then, uh, then I asked them for an Eagle Globe and Anchor Eye, and they uh, they made that one. That's awesome. And I asked them for a first tank. I used to have a first tank battalion one, like the you know like the tack mark. I, right. I asked them for one of those, and uh, they made one of those. They made a whole, a whole bunch of them, yeah. but they don't last real long. The sun wears them out and all that. Okay. This most recent one, uh, me and my wife we went down to the deep because it's hard to find an eagle, a metal Eagle Globe and Anchor that's right. that size. It's very small to be the size of your pupil. Right. And I went down to the depot and they had these little charm bracelets for, uh, you know, like a recruit's going to get his girlfriend before he goes home. And they had a little eagle blow and off of it. I said, that's the right size. So we bought that little $10 charm bracelet. And my wife, who I've been married to just under 30 years. We're, we're at our 30 year mark in a few months. Congratulations. Just a great, oh, thank you. Just a great Marine Corps wife. Just, a, just an incredible blessing in my life. But one of the things that makes her such a good Marine Corps wife is she's very frugal. So this little like $10 Marine Corps bra bracelet that we mutilated to take the Eagle Corbin <laughs> anchor off of it, she kept it. She still wears the rest of it. <laughs> so that's why I love her. She's just a incredibly frugal woman, great Marine Corps wife, very supportive of the whole mission, uh, everything we do. That's She's awesome. a, a true blessing. Yeah, and you are too, my friend. You, uh, you the, the things you've done since you've gotten out of the Marine Corps, um, you know, authored two books, uh, you know, you ran for Congress, you know, represented the Marine Corps and everything you do. Oh, I've watched, you. I've watched multiple, multiple speeches that you've had, you know, on the national level, um, everything from, from the news to, uh, to your, to your public speeches, um, to include Marine Corps balls, um, just phenomenal. I mean, you, you, oh, you've absolutely, you. absolutely set the standard for, for what a, a retiree should, should do coming out of the Marine Corps and, and keeping the standard alive. And, and for that, I, I absolutely just, you know, I have to thank you. Thank you for everything owe, you've done. Oh, that to my senior drill instructor. They used to teach us that in boot camp. They said, you go home and get a DUI. They're not going to say, Nick Popovich got a DUI. They're going to say, idiot Marine does blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I always, I knew that from the first, from the beginning. Everything I do reflects on everybody else. And I, I don't want to be the one out there embarrassing us. Absolutely. Uh, well, you haven't. And, and, you know, like I said, it's just just phenomenal career up to this point. I'm excited to see where it's going next. You know, and. and uh, thank you, sir. I don't mean to take it down a little bit, but uh, obviously the channel has a purpose. Channel has a message. Channel has a reason. Um, you know, and this this year is hard. Um, it's obviously hard for us wearing the cloth. Hard for us that are that are in the you know in, you know towing the line right now. But I'm sure it's just as hard, if not harder, a gentleman like yourself. That uh, you know the the career you had and, and everything that it's come up to this point, um, just phenomenal. And you know what what messages do you have you know for the audience? Um, well, I, I, with regard to the tanks going away and stuff like that, I mean, I, I don't know if it's really even a message of any sort. Um, 
when, when I was a drill instructor, they used to tell us, they said, you can't wait to put that campaign cover on like when we're in school. And they said, trust me, when you get the end of that, that, that tour, you won't be able to wait to take it off. Mm-hmm. And we used to have an expression then, leave it on the field. Leave, you know, give, give max effort. So that when this tour is done, you, you, you're not going to look back. You're not going to have any regrets. You're not going to think, man, I wish I only had, you know, I wish I'd put out more here, put out more there. And what I would say is, you know, from, from in my time before me, uh, our community, I think our community left it on the field. I think our community really, really when, when people needed tanks, when, when those infantry guys, when they're, when they're advancing on the objectives, they need somebody to just come on and just punch, punch the enemy in the face and knock a hole, we were there for them. And so I think if you're going to look back on a history that, that maybe the, the chapter is closing, if not closed, at least know it was a it was a damn good chapter, you know that, that we left it on the field. We 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 were there when the when 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 we, when we were called. We were there. Well, th- I I can't thank you enough for taking the time out of your busy schedule coming on here, um, and and giving us you know all the time you have and the fantastic stories. I mean, just just absolutely fantastic. And, and someday, you know, somewhere down the line, someone's gonna be watching this and really you know absolutely appreciate it. Um, that day's today, and that's gonna, that day's golf is gonna be as long as YouTube's up and running. I used to hear, I used to hear guys say like, you know, with the American Legion, they'd say like, well, you know, because once you get out, you got all the service organizations. They had a lot of guys would gripe. They'd say, well, I didn't join the American Legion to sit in the bar and tell war stories. And I'd say, what the heck did you join for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love doing that stuff. So, right. Right. <laughs> so, so you're not. So you, this was a this was a blessing to me. This was a blast. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I'm asked for one more story. All right. Something about an AC-130 gunship I'm supposed to ask you. So uh, what's, uh, what's the story behind that one? So when we, were, when we were in Fallujah, when we were the first ones in there, we were advancing. We were just taking ground, and we were, we were very successful. They, they would come out, and they, I guess maybe they just didn't have a lot of experience fighting against that tank or whatever, but they were very eager to fight with it. And we were just putting them down and putting them down and taking block after block, but we finally got stopped. They'd strung all these power lines across the road to where they, the tank was getting admired down there, probably going to get caught up in the tracks. And I couldn't enter this courtyard. And it obviously was important. They had bunkered positions in their sandbag positions. They had a big building with a big, uh, you know, like that World War II style where they got the big mm-hmm. sandbag wall to, to block the door so they can get in and out of it while it's under fire. And they had, so I got stopped there. And it was late in the day, it was late in the afternoon, and the company commander told me, they could, you know, because nobody's got a Bangalore torpedo or nothing like that. Nobody's figuring we're actually going to have to breach something like that. So the company commander, Cam Stoddard, said it, we can get a C-130 gunship on station, but it won't be till after dark because, you know, they're, they're low flying. There was a lot of gunplay in Fallujah at the time, so they, they're not going to fly a big aircraft like that low and slow over the city. It's going to get hit until after dark. So if you wait till after dark, uh, we'll have the C-130 gunship, and they can breach your obstacle. I said, you know, we're oh, good to go, you know, we'll wait. And uh, when the, the gunship reported on station, it was so much fun working with it. Uh, they said, well, first we need a tally, you know, and I got a one to 100,000 map. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna be able to give you a grid, it's gonna do you any good. Right. And uh, they said, well, you got an IR Kim stick. I said, yeah, I got one of those. They said, go chuck it on the obstacle. And, and, and so I drove up to it, I threw it on the obstacle. I said, okay, we got it. They said, back away, let us know when you're 125 meters away. And uh, we'll start firing. I said, good to go. So I, I backed up and I was about 100 meters. You know, I figured they're just being overly yeah. safe. And I told them, go. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was, I was within the, the danger zone. I mean, the mm-hmm. fireball was coming all the way up to my front slope. I was like, holy crap, this thing is awesome. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm asking them, I said, okay, what do you want the shifts in? Because they had a big tanker truck uh, mm-hmm. on the bypass for that ops. So I think they wanted me to turn and go down this alley and they were going to blow that tanker trunk full of, mm-hmm. of fuel. And I, I said, I, I said, I'm, I'm going to give you a shift. I said, what do you want the shifts in? Fifties? <laughs> the, the crew laughed. They said, no, five meters. And wow. I said, you know, and I, I and I'm thinking yeah. they're full of crap. No way are they going to shift five meters. So it's yes. Yeah, right. Just in your cardinal direction and a shift. So I tell them, okay, you know, shift south five meters and it literally shifted from one side of the road to the other that that's how accurate their fire was we put it on the on the tanker truck and that blew us full of fuel we got into that that building i was telling you about that had the the sandbag door they knocked it flat they knocked that whole building to the ground 
we just knocked the snot out of them with this with the C-130 gunship. But then they said, okay, you know, I told them, I said, the road's open. They said, the, the gunship's going to stay on station. I said, good go. Let's, you know, let's go hunting. And we went into the city at night because the, the gunship has got a rotor. It's four, four props. It's making a lot of noise. So they're all looking up for this road. They're not even hearing that, that low electric whining sound that that M1A1 makes. They don't even hear the tank coming. And we are catching them out in the open Get repeatedly, repeatedly. They're just out in the open looking, looking for this, looking for this gunship. They're trying to spot it in the dark sky. They don't even hear the tank coming. We're turning corners and they're just all out in the open. And we're putting them down. But the problem with the city is once you engage, you're not going to get them all on the street. Some of them are going to run into buildings. And when they get into buildings, we can't, we can't do nothing with them, not a tank, not like that. Right. So I would mark it with coax. And the gunship would take the building down from the top. <laughs> and so we realized, wow, this is pretty good. Yeah. So what they so what they started doing was they would tell us, okay, up ahead, you got you're coming to an intersection because they're watching us moving. They're saying, okay, up ahead, you've got an intersection. They would tell us what was around each corner. Hmm. And then so we're not hitting the corner blind. Right. So we're knowing we got enemy this side, enemy this side, enemy this side, whatever. And then once we would make that corner, if they were to get away, we mark it for the air and the air knocks the building from the top. It was unbelievable. Work till we ran out of ammo. We did that all night till we ran out of ammunition. <laughs> And uh, I personally, I don't know if anybody did that before me. I personally think I invented that, <laughs> well, we'll, but I don't we'll know. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. <laughs> and, and that, that, ladies and gentlemen, that is, uh, that is the, the gunny pop. <laughs> A C-130 uh, tactics uh, instruction course. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, no, man, thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Um, honored, to, like I said before, honored to have you. And for the channel viewers, um, thank you all. Uh, thank you for subscribing. Um, please, uh, please stay tuned and, uh, remember to hit the notification bell. And, uh, with that, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Number five.